Good morning. First, I, I want to say to the Asian American community, I grieve with you. Asian lives matter. You know, whatever it is we're doing in terms of learning how to live together, we're not doing a very good job. And so I really want to be as authentic as I know how today. But I start first with the definition, authenticity is living your life according to your own values and goals, rather than those of other people. Authenticity means you're true to yourself, to your own personality, to your own values, to your own spirit, regardless of the pressure that you're under to act otherwise. That comes from the website mindtools.com. Authenticity is being true to yourself. But the truth is, many do not know how to be true to themselves. They act out, they project, they lash out and hurt and harm, project their hate onto others. This has been the story of our species. And so I think that we cannot truly be authentic and real until we understand our conditioning and motives for why we do what we do. And that comes from experience. And of course, you know, I like to say this, this is my one sermon, self-examination. Many who lash out are doing so because they have not looked deep enough within. And when you look deep within, you see that most of us are acting out of past hurts and traumas, breakups and breakdowns, abuses and abusers, complicated, often corrosive family systems. It's a lot. And you soon realize from a universalistic perspective that all human beings have issues. None of us are exempt. And it's humbling, really. And it's also empowering. I don't have to put anyone on a pedestal. It seems that this is the story of us. And in this story, our reaction to life creates an energy. I talked about emotion weeks ago. Energy in motion. That's emotion. Cause and effect. Physics. And that's where we get to learn and experience and to grow. You know, maybe I'm expecting too much from our species, from our civilization, to play this game of life fairly. We are just an organism that really just came of age. We didn't get the written word. Think about this until the Gutenberg, Gutenberg Press in the 1400s. And by the way, what was the first book printed? The Holy Bible in Latin. And it took more than 200 years, really, for literacy to take hold in Western society. So we're talking about really only about 400 years of reading and mass communication, people learning the intricacies of their own bodies and their relationships, the sociology of it. We really have only just begun to understand our our domestication. But I want to start somewhere. And so today I start with the written word from that first book ever published in Genesis. And some of you know these two stories. I'm not going to tell the stories, but but more so what I see emerging in Genesis, the book of Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve, the story of Cain and Abel, Abel. And there it is early in the story as you're reading, Adam said to God when he was asked a question about eating this forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge. He says, the woman you gave me told me to eat this fruit. <laughs> right there, the first story 
no personal responsibility. He blamed the woman. And from the beginning here, we see a masculine narrative based in inequality emerging from the printing press and made public. From the aristocracy down to the commoner, eventually this is the story that pervades humankind. The relationship between man and woman, between two people, was never really understood to being co-equal. The dominant energy was considered dominant and the other energy committed, uh, considered submissive. Instead of understanding them as complementary, we set them up right there as adversaries. And it was doomed from the start. And then later on, we read about two brothers, Cain kills Abel, jealousy, envy. Early in, blaming, jealousy, envy, the story of us. The writers are showing this fractal pattern that makes up all human systems. One-to-one -one relationships generally exist in complicated webs of miscommunication. That's what the writers tell us right here. Between the sexes, between human beings. You know, when you look closely at Western civilization and world civilization, really, you see these two narratives, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, playing out again and again. Different names, different towns, different countries, same stuff. Blame, power, greed, killing, exploitation. Amazingly, something good always emerges to move us forward. A light shining in the darkness. Do we have to evolve this way? Does it have to be this nasty of a tale? Maybe there's a better way. I don't know. I've been watching uh, Mankind, the story of us. Uh, it's on uh, Amazon Prime. And it's interesting. This film was done, I think, 2018, 2019. And they did not use the word humankind. It used the word the story of mankind. And I think it's actually quite appropriate. It's an 11-part series, about, you know, 55 minutes each. And it's all about the work that men, mostly, have done to survive on the planet. It's Adam's perspective. And you know this because nearly all the heroes were men and the stories were eerily the same, whether you're talking about the samurai in Japan who emerge out of this early, violent, vicious, sword-fighting feudal system, or the Mongols and their wars, and the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, and the Greeks, and of course the Romans, the Egyptians, the Africans, the Druids. The story of mankind is quite brutal. And the priests, the people who do my job, were, were complicit in this process of brutality. Wolves dominating sheep. Wars, millions exterminated. Human life devalued. Bows and arrows, knives and guns, all kinds of weapons to subdue and control humans, mostly by ambitious, ambitious and ruthless men on a quest for rare things, precious metals. But it's a story of power over and not a story of power with. Many of these men were gifted, smart, but had this insatiable need to explore and exploit at any means necessary. This is pretty much our story. And it's mostly men, we have to be honest, who have been slaughtering each other for millennia. Cain and Abel have not reconciled. Adam and Eve have not found equality. And Eve has barely seen, has barely been seen in his story, history. Tribe against tribe, nation against nation. There are no innocents. And yet in spite of himself, 
He created new pathways where people, despite the vast difficulties, have been able to evolve and carve out space in this crazy narrative, in this story of bloodshed and pandemics and disease and conquest. Resembling Groundhog Day when you watch history, there's nothing new under the sun. It's quite unimpressive. And you have to ask yourself, where is God? Where is love? Where is truth? And you have to look closely and see it because it's there and it emerges. And sometimes it comes out of the nastiest situations. But the way I see it, we're still early in our human development. When you look at the tra trajectory of time, we have not been here very long, just for a very brief moment. Snap your fingers. That's how long humans have been on the planet in this form. I don't even think we can snap our fingers in this sort of evolved stage of rationalization and thinking. So my point is that being in right relationship is a new idea. We don't know what we're doing. We're trying to figure it out. But it does come from an evolved sense of the self. That came when individual rights sort of began to, began to manifest in Western civilization, particularly the United States. Liberty, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's a new thing to see people as equal. Most people lived and died knowing sort of their place. So this is a new planet. No longer is the privilege of ruling just for, you know, family legacies or kings and queens. We all have the ability to sort of, in, in this country, move through systems and become. There still is a lot of racism and sexism and misogyny, of course. And we don't know how to be in relationship. So we've only just begun. But how shall we begin? By learning the basics. By learning how to talk to each other. By learning how to be in relationship. By learning what authenticity means and what it doesn't mean. And next week, accountability. Being authentic means you're being honest with yourself. If I'm honest with myself, I recognize there are traumas that I have to man uh, manage. Traumas, some of them ancestral, some of them, you know, through the story of us. I have to learn how to live an equal and equitable life. I have to learn how to do power with instead of power over. I have to learn to be in relationship without man uh, manipulation. We know leveraging people against each other. We know that well. We know how to bully and dominate, take and hoard. That's been the story of us. But, and we have to own that. But we need new, tool, new tools. Like this uh, BBC SAE model. That's a new tool. Like when I talk about emotional literacy, expressing your feelings and needs in non-judgmental ways, that's a tool. Nonviolent communication, that's a tool. Left to our own vices, Lord Acton, the British historian is right. He said in 1887, all power tends to corrupt, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. So being a leader and being a human being, the process of humility must continue to happen again and again. And this message has been there through the sages and the prophets and all the people, but it has been mostly ignored. That life is about service to not just yourself, but service to others. So as a species, we are the products of our stories. And admitting this is the beginning. The Hebrew Bible and New Testament are male versions of his story. And although there are, there's a lot of good in our major religions, we have to be honest, they too are his story. It's a one-sided narrative. Women, people of color, 
Well, I should say that people of color actually had a lot to do with some of the major books in the Bible, but women in particular did not write the holy books we use in religion today. And so our religious story is not yet inclusive. It's not our story. It's not even her story. It's still his story. It's Adam's story. Adam was the firstborn. And Eve was created using one of Adam's ribs. She caused him to sin. And the, and the story basically that pervades the earth is that life is his and not hers. She's a quiet companion. She's not his equal in the story. Our history today is a male-centric perspective. I think I've made that point. <sighs> Balancing is needed, and I think it's slowly happening. And what I'm noticing now is that at least in the United States and in England, at least on television and some of the programming with the growth of Netflix and Prime Video and all these other things, you are beginning to see more uh, of a female and non-Eurocentric perspective. And I love it. I've talked about TV commercials and how they've shifted. And I'm seeing the perspectives of people of color emerging more. We are trying to do something different. It's not to say that masculine energy is not relevant, because it is, and it always will be, but we're talking about an imbalance. We're talking about balancing energy that will allow shift to happen, that will allow equity to manifest, that will allow us to live in a world with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Yeah, you watch TV and you see a person of color or a woman uh, on the screen and she's the protagonist, she's the black protagonist. We're getting her perspective. The signals, uh, this signals to me that uh, at least in some things we are evolving. One of my favorite shows that uh, I keep up with now when Joni tells me about it is This Is Us, which gives us, uh, gives us examples of couples as equals working through their stuff, even as they play within their roles within old systems. They show us the dynamics in a multicultural family. They touch on uh, issues of uh, gender and sexual orientation. They show brothers and sisters, Cain and Abel's, working their stuff out, keeping it real getting upset, but coming back to the table to find productive solutions. It's an impressive time to be alive. And they show us perhaps where we're headed to a different story so that different outcome, outcomes can emerge. The feminine and PLC energy is emerging to lead us to beloved community. And we should be excited about that. I believe the human destiny is moving toward me-centric and tribe-centric to human-centric. Humanity is evolve evolving to a better version of itself and always has. And for many with this shift, it feels weird to be alive right now. I get that. We're having to adjust to this shift, to this new perspective, but it's a healthy shift and it's needed. And I'm proud to be a part of a religion that embraces this change in power. Aren't you sick of that old energy of bullying and dominating? It's exhausting. As I will share in my next sermon, us versus them is a very low level of consciousness or self-awareness, awareness, just above me, myself, and I. Us versus them has been the prevailing paradigm 
of human beings and it hasn't worked. Us versus them gives a false sense of security. It does not allow for authentic relationships. It creates enemies and it assumes the worst intentions. It has no trust or faith. Us versus them is predatorial in its approach and it is not sustainable. It will go extinct eventually. As Unitarian Universalists, there is only one side for us, the side of love, love in all of its expressions and manifestations. And my hope for a world, for this world, is that there's a generation that comes of age that grows up without trauma, a generation that feels fully safe and secure wherever they are on the planet. Hmm. I pray for a world where people don't have to slay the dragons in their lives, the traumas, the griefs, the pains, complicated family systems. Dr. Daniel Amen has many good books. I'm reading his current book, How to Slay Your Dragons. I want to talk about him soon as well. Some of those dragons, the abandoned dragon or the flawed dragon or the responsible dragon or the angry dragon, judgmental dragon, grief and loss dragon, hopeless or helpless dragon, ancestral dragons. Hey, man, is he talking about me? No. <clears throat> I took a test on one of his websites, and those were all my dragons that I have to work through. I'm a work in progress just like you. And as a sidebar, I have a deep notion that the churches that survived this pandemic and into the, and leading, the ones leading us into the future will be churches that embrace this kind of work. They'll be pluralistic. They'll be integrating a new narrative of history with science and spirituality, including psychology and neuroscience to understand brain function. I'll talk more about that. And of course, as I heard on a call this week, young people are yearning for some ancestral worship. So some of those earth-based practices, those will have to be worked in. Sounds like to me that Unitarian Universalism can be at the right place at the right time. We are that new wine, perhaps, that needs to be put into new wine skins. But you know, one thing is we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We don't throw all of the past out. There's been many lessons that we've learned from the past, but we keep that. It's a valuable teacher in our human develop, development toward authenticity. So given where we are, as I said earlier, I don't believe that most people know how to be authentic. But I know most want, uh, wish to be. But because many of us have not examined or slayed our dragons, we drag them along in every interaction and relationship. Those old dragons love shame, but the key for us is to shine light on them. Shame, that's cancel culture. And cancel culture is not new, it's just more amplified because of social media. I do not want to be a part of an institution that cancels people. I do want to be a part of an institution that holds people accountable. Canceling is that old way of extermination. It's that old way of domination where we work to subdue and subject. It's power over, not power with. And it has not created authenticity among friends or lovers. It has not created genuine community. So let's just stop doing it. In the old way, you know, when you hurt someone uh, or when you're hurt by someone, you hurt back. And if there's fear and you're afraid to hurt back, then you get some muscle to do your, your you know, hitting back. Tit for tat, Hatfields versus McCoys. But perhaps today, right here in this moment, we have an opening with this ministry of equal standing. With these, with you, 
you powerful people chosen for such a time as this. Perhaps we now can choose to be co-creators of a new story of exploration that mines the depths of our being instead of pillaging our planet. And there will be new rules in this relationship, and some of those new rules will be some of the old rules that we remember. From Robert Fogum's book, Everything I Needed to Learn, I Learned in Kindergarten. Some of those old rules about being fair and playing nice, we need to bring those back. But we do need to let some things go, polarization. Because we're trying to build an effective way to build social movements. And that happens in person and in real life. That's what Miss Loretta Ross said in the New York Times op-ed. Op -ed. She also knows that what we've done has not worked as best as it could have, and as it can. And so I am proposing an old new way, grab what's significant in the old, bring it to the new. And I say that that starts with you, you deciding not to cancel, but instead connect. You deciding to call in instead of calling out. You deciding to collaborate instead of compete. You deciding to face your dragons. If we give this a chance, we just might open enough hearts to witness a glimpse of a world where abundance flows, a place for all souls to lead bold and compassionate lives, where peace, liberty, and justice for all prevails, a world where we understand that we are all interconnected and interrelated, <laughs> a world where no matter where you are on the planet, your home, a world of exploration and learning and respecting Mother Earth and her many cycles, a world that takes us to other places in our universe and perhaps even meet beings from other places when we're ready. Yes, I see a world for our children and our children's children where sharing instead of shaming is the norm, a world that is restorative and not retributive. This my dear friends, is my hope. This is my work. This is my continued prayer for our story, the story of us. In the name of all that is holy and good, I leave these words. Amen.